we ask you to do just that, and that you'll teach us more about the lovely name of Jesus and how to serve and glorify him in our lives. In his dear name we pray. Amen. Teaching from parables this morning. And uh, we're sharing together some things about ministry, witnessing, preaching, whatever you care to call it. And uh, I love to think of this uh, series because I have to think back over about um, 45 years of ministry. Some of the things that God has been trying to teach me and show me. And uh, if you get anything out of it, well, I'll be thankful. But um, I want to make the principle of witness or preaching, if I call that, use that word. I'm not thinking especially of a pulpit in a congregation. For preaching is essentially one to one. But um, I want to make the privilege of preaching, of witnessing, just um, shine in your heart and thrill you, as it has done me. And we're going to talk, first of all, this morning about some of the principles of witness. Some of the principles of witnessing, which are very few, really, but they're very clear. And the application of them is absolutely endless. I, I, I can just uh, bear j witness to the sheer joy of preaching Christ. The sheer thrill of it. It's um, what opportunities there are of satisfying relationships with other people. A deep understanding of people. A personal growth in spiritual character. The thrill of seeing other people grow. It's a task that never grows old and never grows stale. And the funny thing is that at every age in, of life, whatever you're in, there are always further opportunities of ministry. You become, first of all, you're a brother to people, and then you're a father, and then you're a grandfather, a great-grandfather. There's always something fresh, some fresh opportunity of ministering to people. It's a great thrill. I'm biased, of course, and I'm all in favor, heavily in favor, of pastoral ministry. Of a ministry that sticks at one place and sees it through till God shifts you somewhere else. Because that way you see people grow and you face disappointments and you face all the, all the attacks of the enemy. You keep at it at the same place. And if you stay long enough, what a thrill to see. Um, another generation grew up to know and love the Lord Jesus. But first, let me define preaching, or ministry, or testimony, whatever you call it. It's the, the communication, that's a long word, but you can spell it now, the communication of truth through people, through men, to men. Or women. All for ladies preaching. If you think that's unsound, you come and have a word with me about it after. <laughs> Four ladies to one man on the mission field, what on earth would we do without them? There are two essential elements to preaching. To ministry. One is truth, and the other is personality. One is truth, and the other is personality. Neither can be omitted. If it's going to be preaching. The most authoritative uh, uh, statement of the word of God that's put over in any other way than through the personality of one person to another is not preached truth. 
I'll repeat that. The most authoritative, that's an awful long word also, the most authoritative statement of the word and the will of God that's communicated in any other way than through the personality of one man or one woman to another is not preached truth. It's got to come through personality. Now, God could have done it in other ways. He could have written his word on the sky. He could have spoken it in thunder and lightning. But he chose to do it differently. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. It pleased the Lord through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Another translation, perhaps a better one of that statement is, it pleased the Lord through the preaching of foolishness. The cross was foolishness. It pleased the Lord to do it that way, through preaching. And uh, if it isn't coming through personality, it's not preaching. On the other hand, if we speak that which isn't the truth, if we uh, entertain, or you use our powers of persuasion, put on pressure, to seek to get people to listen to us, that's not preaching. <coughs> the first, that is... Um, not preaching through personality. The first lacks the personality of the preacher. The second method lacks truth. Again, preaching is, or witnessing is, bringing of truth through personality. And it must have both. Truth and personality. And that's how the Lord Jesus chose to extend the knowledge of himself in the world. Deliberately chose that. Could have chosen many other ways, but he didn't. He communicated truth to others, to a few, sent them out to proclaim it to other people. You see that? in uh, the twelve disciples, in the seventy, and at Pentecost. That was his method. Reaching men through men. With a fire of the Spirit burning in their hearts. That had opened the whole being to God and to people. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Oh, get that. Just let me repeat that. <laughs> the fire of the Spirit of God burning in our hearts opens our whole being to God and to people. Those disciples and apostles were like glass. Just like a piece of glass. They can take in truth on one side and let it out on the other. Take in truth on one side, let it out on the other. John eight twelve. Matthew five fourteen. Philippians two fifteen. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Philippians 2, 15, you live in a wicked generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He's the light, we're the light. Take in truth, put it through. Let it through, let it out. 
Sorry, I told you. I'm not going to tell you again. You can put down your notes. Look at notes. Look at notes. Story, the old man told us, uh, more than once probably. <laughs> yeah. But walking in the jungle in Africa, remember it with my daughter. Oh, with metal here? Didn't tell him. Oh. Ooh, walking <laughs> well, with my daughter in the jungle I did tell you I did didn't I in a lovely moonlight night beautiful night full moon star shining you know makes you want to hold hands full moon and she said to me daddy isn't the moon shining brightly and I said to her, it's terrific. And then I said, how stupid can we be? She said, what on earth do you mean? Well, I said, you know the moon can't shine. It's only a lump of lackluster material that's got no capacity to shine. But it keeps itself in orbit in relation to the sun. And it turns its face heavenward and it catches the glow and the warmth of the sun and it reflects it into the darkness of the world. That's a Christian. That's exciting. You're in orbit in relation to the sun, S-O-N, and turning your face heavenward, Godward, you catch the glory, and catch the thrill, and catch the wonder, and reflect it into the darkness of the world. That's a Christian. No, ten years as a seminary, uh, ten years in a seminary will never substitute for that. Never. Right? Why should Jesus choose that way? Why should he choose that way? Because the truth of Christianity is first and foremost personal. The truth of Christianity is first and foremost personal. You can tell the gospel in doctrine but it's best known in life. Scottish people have a great phrase. They say, it's better felt than telt. <laughs> it's better felt than telt. In other words, it's better feeling it than just telling it out. Got it? Christianity is Jesus. He says, I am the truth. And truth can only be perfectly expressed in his person. John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. So, truth through personality is our definition of, of ministry. Now listen, it must come through the person. Through him. Not merely from his lips. Not merely from his mind and out through his pen. It's got to come through him. Through his character. Through his affections and love. Through his whole moral being. It's got to come genuinely through him. Now you see, that's the difference between two preachers of the Word of God. And you can tell it in a second without being critical. You can tell. In one case, the gospel, the truth, is coming over them. Flavoured with their littleness flavoured with the superficiality and somehow belittled just because they're little people. But the gospel comes through another. And you receive it because it comes with Holy Spirit conviction. 
Ever heard somebody preach about the Holy Spirit who hasn't got the Holy Spirit himself? His daddy. The man's just a printing machine or a trumpet. But he has the Holy Spirit in his heart. He's a messenger. Haggai 1.13 The Lord's messenger in the Lord's message. Haggai 1.13 Oh, you recall, you recall preachers you've heard like that, who stir you to the depths. It's not them, it's the Spirit of God in them. Oh, my life has been blessed by men like that. F. B. Meyer, Dinsdale Young, great man he was. Sure, I told you about going to Westminster Central Hall and listening to him when I was backsliding miles away from God but I couldn't help going somehow the Spirit of God just drew me there Westminster Central Hall that's the headquarters of Methodism in, in London 3,000 people in those days attended it now I think it's less than 200 place was packed you know he had a long black coat and a black collar black um, tie and long hippie hair right over his shoulders and you know he read every word he preached read it oh, yes. all the time yes, it was fantastic and he preached for more than an hour an hour and everybody was spellbound and we all waited waited for the event which occurred every five minutes he just looked up and when he looked up you saw the glory and I said and I was wretchedly miserable and awfully unhappy and making a blowing it completely the Christian life I was about 25 at the time I said Lord that man's got what I need and you of course you know we all know boy I went up and down California on behalf of, uh, well, I better not tell you who, um, <laughs> for three months preaching in a different church every Sunday and asked to go to the Christian Education Department and sat in at 9.30 on the college age group, about an average of 50 attending it, 50 or more. And I listened. And they were being taught from a blackboard taught all the doctrines and all the dispensations and everything was sound and absolutely correct tremendous but you know what they could hardly wait for the end of the hour panting to get out in every case bored stiff absolutely bored stiff and I thought oh God what on earth is going to happen when those fellows leave and those fellows and girls leave this college age group they're not going to go into that church there wouldn't be such fools the church was sound enough but there was no life oh you get me you seek to be the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message and let the chips will fall where they may and one of the most searching points in giving testimony or ministry is this that you're conscious of variation in transmission. By that I mean is sometimes you're all wide open to God and you're eager to go. But other times you'd rather do anything than preach. Something seems to clog your transparency. You know what I mean. Blocks it. And you'll know the difference. And the people you're speaking to will know it too. Therefore, how tremendously important it is to be trained for the job. This is just the beginning. I mean, Cadbury. 
Because training for the job is nothing less than the making of a man of God. Some people, somebody asked me one day, how long does it take you to prepare a sermon? I said, on an average, about five years. You may have a lot sort of bottled up, gradually coming to life, gradually growing, but not ready for the fire to get out. And therefore they're held in. It takes a long time. And how long does it take, take to train for the ministry? Not three years at a seminary, not three years at college, not three years at anywhere, but a lifetime of the making of a man of God. It's not merely acquiring platform technique. But the making of a whole man until I'm capable of receiving and transmitting Jesus. A lifetime. Now you'll think perhaps I'm, I'm doing a very serious um, re uh, reflection upon uh, the idea of theological training. Oh no, not a bit of it. No, I'm not underestimating the necessity of good reading and wide reading, but that won't make you a preacher. Read either before you leave uh, Cape and Ray or get it. Get it second hand. The memoirs of Robert Murray McShen. I thought somebody would say that. You're bound to ask that. I couldn't help it. M.C. and I'm not so sure I know. M.C. Mac. C. Capital C. H. E. Y. N. E. The memoirs of Robert Murray McShane. Do you know he died when he was 28? He's a minister in Dundee, Scotland. And the memory and the fragrance <coughs> of his ministry is with people yet. He just revolutionized that country. And that, 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 that explains what I mean. But you see, you can't explain it. You've got to experience it and see in your own life the miracle. So that nothing can ever be a substitute in testimony or witness or preaching. I'm using those three words, um, you know, meaning the same thing. Nothing can ever be a substitute for communicating truth through personality. Radio doesn't do it. Literature won't do it. Let somebody really speak truth through himself, coming through his whole personality. And other people will listen. May not agree, but they'll listen. Nobody will be neutral. One day I hope, ooh, <laughs> I'd like to come. Invite me sometime to come to your church where you're pastor. You and your wife, hopefully. And um, <laughs> invite me there. Invite me there. And let me come and see you at the job. I'd be absolutely thrilled. No. Oh, yes, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. The making of a man of God. And the authority in such a life is not your own, it's from the Lord. It's revealing Christ. And every time you get up under your pulpit, you're making an attack on hell. That's the thrilling thing. Before you begin preaching, you just say, Lord, bind the devil. Claim victory by the blood of Jesus. And you let yourself loose. The greatest definition I've heard of homiletics is from a black preacher in the States 
who said uh, his homiletics were read yourself full think yourself clear pray yourself hot then let yourself loose oh boy you can't beat that you really can't that's real homiletics <laughs> You want to repeat it? Oh. Mm, I've forgotten now. <laughs> I'm hopeless. Hold it, Max. I think that going to reverse gear. Um, oh, yes. Here it comes. Ready for it. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh. Read yourself full. Think yourself clear. Pray yourself hot. And let yourself loose. That's it. That's authority coming from heaven. An assault upon hell. Every time you're witnessing to somebody, that's what you're doing really. If it's only one person in the street to whom you give out a tract, it's an attack on hell. And you're most unpopular with the devil. But it becomes that, becomes that, because in your life, you have with, now I underline these next two words, strict firmness. Strict firmness. You have given the best hours of every day, every week, to meditate upon his word. You have given the best hours of every day, every week, to meditate on his word. You remember me saying to you that the price of Christian leadership is not publicity but obscurity. Not publicity but obscurity. And therefore when you stand to witness to a crowd or to one person you know that as you're doing so you have something to say from heaven. 1 Corinthians 11.23 That which I have received from the Lord I have delivered unto you. You're not the origin of it. You're simply the channel. Now just let me say a few words about truth and about personality. They're really tied in to two New Testament words. 1 John 1 5. Message and witness. That's the fundamental idea of all testimony. A message given for transmission. Two words. A message and witness. 1 John 1 5.
but a message which we cannot transmit till it's become part of our experience. Got it? Message we can't transmit till it's become part of our experience. And we can give our own testimony to its spiritual power. It's real to us. If you keep the word message before you, as you prepare, you'll be kept from trying to be clever, trying to be original, trying to be different. You'll be kept from that. If you keep the word witness before you, you'll be saved from unreality. Some saying some things that aren't real to you. Of course, you're bound to speak in public sometimes of things you've never experienced. Death, for instance. Heaven. Maybe suffering. Nevertheless, remember this. A violinist will be remembered for, for his skill and will never forget our good friend here. Can't remember his name. It's <laughs> <laughs> you I'm thinking about. <laughs> A violinist will always be remembered from his skill. And a singer will be always remembered for his or her voice. We'll never forget Sandra, who sang last term. Tremendous voice she had. What a terrific voice. But a messenger will be forgotten in his message. And you've got to be prepared for that. John one thirty seven. The two disciples heard him speak, that's John the Baptist, and they followed Jesus. The two disciples, John 1, 37. Two disciples heard John speak, and they followed Jesus. John, forgotten. Remember... A messenger is never telling anything new. Never telling anything new. It's the same message which the church has told for 2,000 years. And you're backed by multitudes of people who've told it before you. And multitudes of people are telling it all around you. What assurance that gives as you're preparing a message. And your mind goes for a moment to the whole, church, whole body of Christ worldwide and how you begin to love them. People you've never seen, people of different colors, different races, they're all saying the same thing in a different way, of course. But they're all doing the same job. <laughs> Tremendous. Ooh. The worst form of heresy, the worst form of heresy is not preaching error not preaching error but it's some self-willed self-opinionated man who thinks he's discovered something new a new truth and in order to declare it he severs himself from the church and forms his own group 
independent, fundamentalist, Bible-believing community. Because he's discovered something new. Alas, alas, says Vance Havner, when the tide is out, every little shrimp has its own puddle. <laughs> Boy, that's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> and then but all oh, when the tide comes in bye and I have a feeling we're living in days when the tide is coming in exciting there are two perils in the preaching of truth I'll just mention these quickly one is criticism and the other is mechanism. That's M-E-K. No, it isn't. It's M-E-C-H-A-N-I-S-M. But I don't know why. But that's our English language. One is criticism and the other is mechanism. I'll explain them. By criticism. I mean, the peril of discussing a verse in the Bible from the outside. Repeat. Two perils. One is criticism and the other is mechanism. Oh. Oh, wait a minute now. Oh, yes. By criticism. Here. Yeah, I've got it now. It's coming now. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, go into top gear now. We're getting late. By criticism, I mean the peril of discussing a verse or a portion of the Bible from the outside and not putting ourselves within its power. In other words, to study it in order that I may understand it but forgetting about obeying it. Got that? To study it in order that I may understand it but forgetting about obeying it. To take it to pieces by examining it rather than letting it tear me apart by its sheer authority. Got that? Oh, that's the difference in the study of the Word of God. Oh, what a difference that makes. I repeat, quickly. The peril of discussing a text or a verse or a passage from the outside and never putting myself within its power, I study it in order that I can understand it, rather than a bed. I study it to take it apart, to take it to pieces, to examine it, rather than let it tear me apart by its sheer authority. That's what the Bible does. Because Christian living is not going through the Bible. It's the Bible going through you. There's a mighty big difference. <clears throat> hmm. If I consider it simply as a problem for discussion, without letting it into my heart, then I preach about Christ instead of preaching Him. I preach about Him. But I won't preach him. You and I aren't here to discuss a problem, but to announce a message, to proclaim a saviour. To discuss Christianity and society and politics, well, that's maybe good, but to proclaim Christ in order that men may get saved, that's much better. The peril of mechan of criticism. Get me? If you don't quite get me, 
I would in a later. Finally, mechanism is the peril of forgetting that the gospel is primarily for individuals. And its ultimate goal is the salvation of multitudes. Mechanism. The peril of forgetting that the gospel of Christ is primarily addressed to individuals. And its ultimate goal is salvation of multitudes. All successful preaching is talking to people one by one. The church has many agencies to help to lead to people to Christ. But primarily, it's for the nurture of the individual. Forgetting, forget that, you're in grave danger of reproducing it in yourself. When you see something wrong in, in another church or another Christian, look for it in yourself, first of all. Well, so much for the truth. Now, personality. Personality. Want to say something about that? But we'll say it at seven o'clock this evening. Okay, immense sighs of relief. Goodbye, hallelujah, and K-O-K-D. See you later. Mm -hmm.